I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Theseus was another of the heroic monster slayers of ancient Greek mythology. The story of how he went to Crete and slayed the Minotaur, a monstrous half-man, half-bull creature, is both his most well-known story today and his oldest story. Surviving references to this story go back to the early days of the Greek Archaic period, and are found in Homer, Hesiod, and in various examples of Greek artwork. But Theseus also had other myths, too. A couple times now in past episodes, I mentioned how Greek storytellers often tried to build on the myths of a preferred hero, to give them a fuller narrative arc. This was either done to enhance the patron hero of the storyteller's own community, or the patron hero of a community the storyteller was visiting. It seems with Theseus, the Greeks went into overdrive, or at least the Athenian storytellers and playwrights whose works make up most of the surviving sources went into overdrive. Theseus has his own set of labors, likely modeled on Heracles' labors, and he makes cameo appearances in various other heroes' myths. There are sources that link him to Heracles, Jason and the Argonauts, the hunt for the Caledonian boar, and many other things. Different Athenian storytellers really wanted people to know how important Theseus was, since he was Athens' greatest legendary king. There are two major consequences of this overtime development of the Theseus myths. The first is that all of the references to other heroes make Theseus really hard to place in the imaginary world of Greek mythology. Sometimes the timing is even impossible. For example, one reference might mention that Theseus was an Argonaut, while another says he was too busy to accompany Jason to Colchis. And then there might be another reference that might suggest Theseus' adventures happened well after the voyage of the Argo. If you're trying to arrange all the myths into one loose story, this is incredibly frustrating. All I can do is do my best, choose a timeline that makes sense to me, and point strange things out along the way. The other consequence of the way the Theseus myths developed is more real-world. The literary sources for many Theseus myths are typically from the later centuries of ancient Greece and Rome. There are also some Athenian classical period plays that feature him too, but there is very little about Theseus in the earlier epic poems of Homer, Hesiod, and others. There is some information, but not much. What this bias towards newer material means is we're getting the full story of Theseus towards the end of its development, and only getting very specific adventures in the earlier periods. So, I'll be pointing this out along the way too. What will be my main sources for these retellings? In my opinion, we get the best overviews of Theseus' legendary life in three. First, there is Apollodorus' library a 2nd century AD collection of myths that I've used a lot so far. Interestingly, unlike with some other heroes like Perseus and Heracles, this is not the best source we have for the Theseus myths. Apollodorus' Theseus section is fairly short, but it may have been longer in the past. Most of Apollodorus' third book is lost to history, but we know it contained more information on Theseus from ancient notes left by people who owned it and provided summaries. Another source is Diodorus of Sicily's huge work, The Library of History. Like Apollodorus, I've talked about Diodorus a lot on the pod. He lived in the 1st century BC, covers a lot of things from Greek mythology, and has great details about Theseus. The third main source I'll be referencing is Plutarch. He lived in the 1st century AD and was a Greek historian and philosopher. His most important works were a series of biographies for various important ancient Greeks and Romans, like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Out of the ones that survive, two of these biographies are about important mythical figures. There's one on Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, and another on Theseus, the mythical founder of Athens, which I'll be referring to a lot in this episode. So on to the myths of Theseus. First thing is, where did he come from? All the sources are fairly consistent in that Theseus' father was a man named Aegeus, and his mother a woman named Aethra. So, who were they? Aegeus was a member of the Athenian royal family, the eldest son of one of the early kings of Athens. 
there are several early kings of Athens, all supposedly descended from the first king, Cecrops, who was half man, half snake, and born out of the earth. The list of kings after Cecrops is very messy, so I won't go into too much detail. There's also not a whole lot of surviving material to work with. Some ancient Greek historians tried to make sense of the material they did know by developing their own lists of kings, and these aren't always very consistent. What you need to know, though, is there was a series of kings. A handful of early ones are born out of the earth just like Cecrops. The kingdom itself fought wars against its neighbors and gradually grew in power. Several different members of the royal family repeatedly deposed each other to become king. A few of them were also the ancestors of other people I've mentioned over the course of the podcast. People like Phaeton, who foolishly rode Helios's chariot across the sky, and Adonis, who was a lover of Aphrodite, are linked to Athenian royals in very messy family trees. Anyway, in the list of kings, we eventually get to Aegeus. He was originally only a prince, born in exile in the city of Megara. But Aegeus grew up, dreaming of his birthright, and at some point he and his brothers assembled an army, attacked Athens, and defeated their cousins, the current rulers. After that, different parts of the kingdom were divided among the brothers. Aegeus, because he was the oldest, became the ruler of the city-state of Athens. The old pattern did not go away, though. Aegeus was forced to expel one of his brothers to consolidate his power further. But Aegeus's rule was never secure. He faced numerous plots and dissent from other factions in the royal family, including the descendants of past deposed kings. These distant cousins, like Aegeus many years before, considered the king a usurper and dreamed of taking the throne for themselves. To make matters worse, Aegeus had no sons of his own. That meant many of his enemies were simply watching and waiting. Knowing if Aegeus died, the crown would be immediately up for grabs. Meanwhile, far away to the south, in the city of Trozen, lived a young woman named Aethra. Aethra was the daughter of Piteus. Piteus was one of the many sons of the hero Pelops, and these sons established their own city-states throughout southern Greece. Piteus founded Trozen, naming it after one of his dead brothers. His daughter, Aethra, was very beautiful, and suitors came to seek marriage with her. According to Pausanias, one of the early ones was none other than a young Bellerophon, the hero who rode the winged horse Pegasus and killed the Chimera. Back in the Bellerophon episode, I went over how all of Bellerophon's adventures start after he was banished from his own homeland. This part of the story occurs even before that. A young Bellerophon arrived in Trozen and asked to marry Aethra. The wedding was actually supposed to go ahead, but before it could, Bellerophon was exiled from his home and the marriage broken off. Aethra would have to wait for someone else to come along. Back in Athens, Aegeus was getting more and more alarmed by his inability to give birth to a son. According to Apollodorus, he had already been married twice. He didn't have any children with his first wife, Meta, so he married a second woman, Chalciope. Once again, though, no children. Running out of options, Plutarch and Apollodorus both describe how Aegeus went to the oracle at Delphi to seek advice. The oracle's response was, Do not loosen the bulging mouth of the wineskin until you have reached the height of Athens, or else you will die of grief. The oracle's advice is a mystery wrapped in a riddle if there ever was one. Now, even though Plutarch and Apollodorus are late sources, we know this prophecy was an established part of the Theseus myths at least a few centuries earlier. A vase from around 430 BC actually shows Aegeus receiving a prophecy from the goddess Themis. She is shown sitting on an oracle's tripod, and was one of several immortals, possibly associated with the Delphi site. In literature, also from around 430 BC, there's also Euripides' Medea play. The play centers on the witch Medea after she comes to Greece with the Argonauts and ends up in Corinth. But in one scene, Aegeus stops in Corinth on his way back from Delphi. He was apparently a friend of Medea's, and he asked her for help deciphering the mysterious instructions to not spill life's wine until reaching his ancestral home. Medea does not actually give Aegeus a straight answer, 
and it is only in this Euripides play that involves Medea even giving advice on the prophecy. Apollodorus, Plutarch, and even Euripides in the same play also have Aegeus eventually travel to Trozen to get Piteus' advice about the oracle's riddle. Why Piteus? Well, he was the cleverest of all the sons of Pelops. He had a reputation for wisdom and for knowing all sorts of ancient lore about the land. Aegeus figured Piteus, of all people, should be able to help him out. When Aegeus arrived, he was welcomed and told Piteus what the oracle said, something about not spilling life's wine or opening up his wineskin before he returned home or he would die of grief. As Aegeus hoped, Piteus did understand what was meant, that Aegeus shouldn't spill his wine, in other words, have sex and, you know, spill his wine, until he got back home to Athens. But Piteus didn't tell Aegeus what he actually thought. Instead, he got the king of Athens drunk, and convinced him to have sex with Piteus's daughter Aethra. How Piteus interpreted the oracle's riddle, and why he got Aegeus to then do the exact opposite of what it said, is not clear, but I think for our purposes, he probably thought about it in a couple ways. Aegeus went to the oracle to ask about his childlessness, and was told not to have sex until he got back to Athens, or he'd die of grief. Did that mean if he waited until getting to Athens to have sex, he'd have a son there, and die happy? Did it mean if he had sex before getting home, he'd have a child, but die unhappy? If you assume any child of Aegeus would cause him to die unhappy, did it mean he had to have sex before getting to Athens to even have a child? As you can tell, there's a number of different possible interpretations, depending on how you read the statement. I think you could say, Piteus realized Aegeus could get someone pregnant before going home, and Piteus decided he wanted whoever it was to be related to him, since it's always good to have family ties to another king. So, a drunk Aegeus and Aethra slept together, and afterwards Aethra became pregnant with Theseus. But, some versions say something else happened that night. That after Aethra slept with Aegeus, the god Poseidon appeared on the scene, and Aethra and him also slept together. Apollodorus, Diodorus, and the Roman Hyginus all mention Poseidon doing this. Plutarch, perhaps because he is a historian and trying to rationalize the more supernatural parts of the story, says the part with Poseidon was a lie made up by Piteus. But Poseidon being the true father of Theseus is an old idea, and it goes all the way back to at least 475 BC, to the poems of a man named Bacchylides. What this all means is that like so many other heroes in Greek mythology, Theseus has two fathers. The human king Aegeus, and the immortal ruler of the sea, Poseidon. In the morning, a hungover Aegeus found out the girl he had sex with was Piteus's daughter Aethra, and figured she was likely pregnant. He took a sword and sandals and hid them under a large rock. He only told Aethra he did this, and told her that if she gave birth to a son, when the son became old enough and was able to lift the rock, he was to take what he found under it and go find Aegeus in Athens. After telling Aethra these instructions, the king left, because he had a kingdom to get back to. Months passed, and Aethra gave birth to Theseus. She raised him in the home of her father Piteus. All three main sources are consistent that, later on, when Theseus was a strong and intelligent young man, Aethra brought him to the rock, to take up his father's tokens and then head to Athens. Theseus pushed on the rock with his shoulder, and moved it. He found Aegeus' sword and sandals, and was ready to go find his father. Piteus warned Theseus about the dangers of traveling to Athens over land, as the countryside was plagued with bandits, murderers, and other dangers. Piteus suggested setting out by sea. But Theseus was not persuaded. He had grown up listening to tales of his famous cousin Heracles, and how he had fought against the wicked everywhere, and purged the land and sea of a whole variety of terrors. Theseus's dreams were full of the other hero's achievements, and Theseus wanted to go out and have his own adventures, not run away from the struggles that lay in his way. He decided to take the more dangerous path, and began his journey by road to Athens. However, 
Piteous was right. The world was a dangerous place, and Theseus soon encountered the first threat. After leaving Trozen, he came to a place near Epidaurus, and came face to face with a man named Periphedes. This man was a demigod, like Theseus. He was either the son of the god Hephaestus, or Poseidon. He was no hero, though. Periphedes was also called Coronetes, the club-bearer, because he carried a large iron club and used it to kill anyone who passed him by. He tried to fight Theseus, but was slain by the young man instead. According to Apollodorus and Plutarch, Theseus liked the man's club so much, he took it for himself and made it his signature weapon, just like how his role model Heracles had taken on the lion skin after defeating the Nemean lion. Next, Theseus arrived at the Isthmus of Corinth, the skinny piece of land that connects southern Greece to the rest of the country. Here he found another man named Sinus, the Pine Bender. There are two slightly different descriptions of why he has this name. Apollodorus says Sinus would force passers-by to reach up to the tops of pine trees, bend them down, and let go, over and over again. When they finally got too tired of holding the trees bent, the tension in the tree would release and they would get launched into the air, fall down, and die. To me, it sounds really funny, like something out of a cartoon. Diodorus says Sinus would bend two pine trees down himself, attach the tops to a traveler's two arms, and then let go. The two trees would straighten, and the poor man tied to them would be ripped apart by the force of the separating branches. Theseus killed Sinus, killing him in the same way he killed others, with pine trees. Next, Theseus came face to face with the Chromionian sow, a large, ferocious pig that terrorized the people living nearby. Apollodorus mentions the sow may have been the offspring of the monster couple Typhon and Echidna. This is likely a later innovation, but it would make Theseus already a monster slayer like Heracles. Other versions have the pig raised by an old woman named Phaea. Plutarch, in his attempts to do away with supernatural things, says Phaea was the monster, and wasn't a pig, but was instead a female bandit who robbed and murdered travelers. After killing the big pig or bandit, Theseus continued on and found himself at the top of some cliffs, near the city of Megara. There, he found another murderer, named Skyron, blocking his way. Skyron may have also been a son of Poseidon. This man sat near the cliff's edge, forcing passers-by to move between him and the cliff. To get him to move out of the way, he told them they had to wash his feet first. But when they were done, he kicked them off the cliff and they fell to their deaths. Once again, Theseus killed him by kicking him off the edge instead. Next, Theseus arrived at Ulysses. There he met Kirkion, who challenged anyone who passed by to a wrestling competition. The loser was killed. In their match, Theseus lifted him up into the air and then smashed him into the ground bashing his face against some rocks. Continuing on, but almost at Athens, Theseus was tired and came to a house at the side of the road. This house was the home of Procrustes, also known as Damastes. Procrustes welcomed Theseus inside, but Theseus soon realized he was yet another murderer. Procrustes had two beds, one big and one small. He forced tall men into the small bed and short men into the big bed. When they didn't fit the beds, Procrustes stretched out the limbs of the short men and cut the limbs of the tall men to make them shorter. Obviously, these poor victims died in the attempt. Theseus forced Procrustes to lie in one of his own beds and then killed him. Acting as a serial killer of serial killers, Theseus had now cleared the road all the way to Athens. These six killings are together referred to as the labors of Theseus. So Theseus, who started off trying to emulate his more famous cousin Heracles, was already doing just that. In fact, the myth of the labors of Theseus may have been made by the Athenians to give them their own Athenian version of Heracles. However, even if that's the case, this myth tradition of the labors of Theseus was already in place in the 5th century BC. Up to now, I've mostly relied on Diodorus, Plutarch, and Apollodorus for my retellings so material from the 1st century BC and later. However, there are examples of vases from the 5th century BC which show Theseus fighting Sinus, the Cromonian sow, Skyron, and Procrustes. 
So everyone except for the club bearer and Kirky on the wrestler. And it's also possible that they were also featured in art that has since been lost. Anyway, in completing the six labors, Theseus gained a formidable and, dare I say, heroic reputation. Once he arrived in Athens, the people welcomed him into the city. But what he found there was unexpected. Athens was divided into a series of competing factions. The streets simply buzzed with paranoid whispers and confusion about what the future would hold. There were the usual clements to the throne, but there was also someone else, a familiar face, the enchantress Medea, now married to Aegeus and living in his palace. At least, Plutarch and Apollodorus have her there. Diodorus makes no mention of Medea, although this tradition undoubtedly goes back another 300 years to at least 430 BC. Euripides' play Medea lays the groundwork for it. That play featured Medea's time in Corinth and how she killed her own children, but Medea also asked the visiting Aegeus if she can find refuge with him in Athens. Little did he know, she meant as a criminal. So we have Medea in Athens when Theseus arrived. She learned of Theseus' arrival and convinced Aegeus to welcome the stranger, but arrange his death. It's not clear if Medea knew who Theseus really was, or if she and Aegeus just saw this mysterious, powerful newcomer as a threat. Medea and Aegeus actually had a son together themselves, named Metis. This fact also suggests the presence of Medea in Athens developed no earlier than the classical period. While Metis is her son with Aegeus in many of the later sources of Greek mythology, the same son is also mentioned hundreds of years earlier in Hesiod's Theogony, but as a son of Medea and Jason. So, it would seem, when Medea was incorporated into the Athenian stories about Theseus, there was also a switch made about who Metis's father was. Additionally, the earliest source we have for Medea wanting to kill Theseus comes from the Hellenistic poet Callimachus in the 3rd century BC. But once again, Euripides, this time in a lost play, may have laid the groundwork for it in the 5th century BC. So, just to summarize how that may have went, in the 7th century BC, Hesiod has Medea and Jason be the parents of Metis. In the 5th century BC, Euripides has Medea ask Aegeus if she can live in Athens, implying that there was a tradition where she was already thought to have moved there after Corinth. Around the same time, Euripides and another man named Sophocles both wrote plays called Aegeus. Both these plays are lost but they may have told how Medea came to Athens and tried to kill Theseus. In the 1st century BC, Callimachus gives us the oldest surviving proof that Medea tried to have Theseus killed, but Diodorus doesn't mention it. In following centuries, most sources have Medea in Athens. Metis is her son with Aegeus, and she does try to kill Theseus. So how does she try and kill this champion of six labors? Well, once again, Theseus was sent to kill something else. This time, he was directed to hunt down and slay the Marathonian bull. Like many of the creatures killed by Greek heroes, this bull was fierce and aggressive and traumatized the people living in the countryside around Athens. But we've also already encountered this bull before. This Marathonian bull, according to Diodorus, Apollodorus, and others, was actually the same animal as the Cretan bull that Heracles went up against years before. What happened was, after Heracles caught the bull and completed his labor, it was released to run wild and ended up near Athens. Like with the trials Theseus encountered on his way to Athens, Theseus found the bull and was able to subdue it. He brought it back to Athens and sacrificed it to the god Apollo. Even though this event is only referenced in the later literary sources, we know the myth tradition was already in place in the 5th century BC. Various examples of Greek vase art show Theseus capturing the Marathonian bull. With the bull dead and Theseus still alive, Medea had Aegeus welcome the stranger to the palace to dine with them at a banquet. The two of them still planned to kill him, though, this time handing him a poisoned cup to drink from. To start the meal, the hero was tasked with cutting the meat. Ready to carve it, Theseus drew his sword, the same one from under the rock back in Trozen. Aegeus saw the sword and recognized it as his own from so long ago. He quickly dashed the poison cup away, recognized Theseus, and father and son embraced. After that, 
Medea and her son left Athens. Apollodorus says Aegeus expelled them, implying she did know who Theseus was, after all. With a Greek son of Aegeus now on the scene, the other clements to the throne decided they could no longer wait for Aegeus to die. Plutarch has them declare war and try and ambush Theseus. But the hero was tipped off and successfully ambushed the ambushers. The defeated clements disappeared, and Theseus was now officially made Aegeus's heir to the Athenian throne. In this first part on the Theseus myths, I covered the origins of the hero, how he was born, and how, when he was a young man, he made his way to Athens to be reconciled with his father. Along the way, he killed dangerous bandits and murderers who plagued the countryside, and these became known as his six labors. These events are placed early in Theseus's life, before his most famous adventure involving the Minotaur. However, the surviving evidence suggests that these stories developed after the Minotaur story, which is found in earlier artistic sources. What seems to be the case is sometime in the 5th century BC, the Athenians built upon their stories of Theseus as the city itself grew in influence. Next episode, I'll cover the Theseus myths involving the Minotaur and the stories the Athenians had for his life after that adventure was complete. As always, thank you for listening.